My name is Doug. Hi, my name is Sarah. Hi, my name is Chris. And today we're going to talk a bit about families and addiction. So one frequently asked question is, how can I help my addicted loved one? This is true. It is a very frequent question. And by your loved one being in treatment is a massive start in you helping your loved one. Um, it's a very big deal for the loved one to actually ask for help and actually want to overcome their addiction to a degree where they gain more awareness of why they use and the need for them being in treatment. So yeah, it's, um, it's a big, big topic. It certainly is and it can go back even further than, you know, from when they get to treatment. You, know, you can see a family member who's got addiction issues and you might be wondering, what can I do to help them stop using? Mm. And unfortunately, there's not a lot. Um, at that stage. Yes, you can make sure that you're not enabling, that you're actually caring, so you're helping somebody, but in such a way that it doesn't enable them to carry on using. Um, that can be quite common within families, um, which isn't surprising. You've got a loved one you care about, you don't want the ramifications of uh, criminal justice or you know health issues, so you try and help. You can often supply money or or take them places to, to facilitate their using um, because it's easier, because it can be really difficult to be around a, a family member who's actually in active addiction. Um, so there are many ways to help and things you need to look at. Yeah. Another frequently asked question. Is how or where do I get help for myself? And why is that important? Um, because there's a lot of damage that's done through an addiction uh, to family members, to the person, to everyone. And, and we definitely need to kind of try to get help for, for the family members as well. Um, try to get over some of the things and, and get through some of you know the things that are going on, on in your head. Yeah, that's right. Um, a lot of hurts can be caused with the addicted loved one. Um, and it's important that the family heal as well, isn't it? You know, it's really important that you have time, whether that be through therapy, whether that be through El Anon, which is a sister fellowship of one of the 12-step fellowships, or Neranon is another one. There's a lot of other smart recovery for family as well. So there is extensive support available online uh, for the loved one because addiction isn't just... It doesn't just affect the actual individual, the addict, it affects yeah. the entire family and friends, you know, and then the community, and it, it does, it goes wider than that. Um, so it's really important that you actually take time out for you to heal. So use the time of your loved one being in treatment or being away from the family for you to actually get some, some help for yourself to heal. Yeah, it's extremely important. One of the things that can happen um, when you've got a... a an addicted family member, an addicted loved one, is as I was talking about the enabling. What you can, what can happen is somebody will take on the role of looking after them. Um, so that can be very difficult um, to give that up because, in a way, you're validating yourself because you're caring for somebody, you're looking after them, you're doing all those things for them, and if they go away and then they come back and they get well, people can feel really lost. Um, because that role has been taken away because the person hopefully is then able to start caring for themselves. Mm. So what you need to do for somebody in that situation is take care of yourself you know, and get involved with the mutual aid groups and, and get support and get help. It's very true, you know, they say that you know, addiction is a, a ripple disease, you know, it's like throwing a stone in the water and it just hits so many people mm. uh, as it moves outwards. Um, so it's very hard work. It's very hard work for the, the, the addict to be in addiction, but it's also very hard work for the, for the family members to be around the family member who they love because essentially what you're doing to a degree is watching them destroy themselves. Yeah. Um, and that, that isn't a pleasant thing to have to come to terms with. You know? And a lot of people have heard you know, about detaching and put about putting up boundaries. And it is detaching and it is about not enabling, but you have to do it with love. And you can be angry at the addiction, whereas the person is still the same person underneath all that. Because the addiction is just a symptom of what's really going on underneath. So it's about having compassion, but it's not about putting yourself in a situation where you are then taking responsibility for the addiction, and you are then taking responsibility for the recovery. Because there's only one person that can get into recovery, and that's the, the person who is the addict. You know? Definitely, yeah. yeah. And that's a good point, I think, Doug, because... You know, it's about the addict taking responsibility, you know, for a lot of the clients we work with, you know, 
it's important that they they ask for help themselves mm -hmm. because that means that they actually want to get well. And what can happen with the family member is they think, oh, a lot of the times it's very common that they'll go to treatment for a month or two months or three months and they'll come home and they're cured. So there's then this level of expectation that I'm going to get my son and my daughter, my husband, my partner, they're going to come back and they're all going to be shiny and new. And to a degree that is true, they will have done some extensive work on themselves, but recovery isn't a cure-all disease. You don't just go into treatment. This is something that you have to actively work on, you know, a day at a time um, is the expression. So for your loved one to actually put action into their recovery is... Yeah is really important um, because they aren't cured when they come home at all. They've, they've dealt with a lot of things in the treatment, but you know it's something that they have to actively work on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So finally, uh, how do I prepare for the homecoming of my loved one? And this can be kind of the most stressful time for both the family and the addict, right? It's the time where they're transitioning into everyday life and starting to put to work all of the tools that they've learned in treatment. Um, and it can be a bumpy road, you know, there's, there's a lot of triggers for the addict, there's a lot of uh, hard times ahead, um, but there's a lot that you can do to support them, right? Uh, give them a loving atmosphere, right? Make sure that you care about them. Um, encourage them to go to meetings, encourage them to, to actively get into their recovery, yeah. and make sure that they know that you're there for them. Yeah, <clears throat> and one of the one of the things that you know this expectations that people have when they come, you know the family member comes home from treatment. Well, the family member, the the addict, also has expectations. Um, so they will come home, and because possibly their trust has been eroded, um, you know they've lied, they've you know gone through the process of being an addiction and what happens in addiction. So people can be very scared about the fact that the family members may be walking on eggshells around them, so then they'll pick up on that and they'll feel very uneasy, they'll feel um, under scrutiny. Um, so all this stuff that comes up, and it's emotional stuff and it's powerful stuff because essentially an addict lives on emotions or lives on not feeling emotions or doing things, you know. So when emotions aren't being dealt with correctly and positively and in a healthy way, they can then build up. So it's about, as Chris said, about encouraging people to go to meetings and to connect with the recovery community. But it's also about the family giving them space, but it's about also about keeping an eye. And that's a difficult balance to get. You know, I mean, some of the things to, to maybe look out for are, you know, if they become more lethargic, if, they start, if their um, hygiene regime starts to slip, if their sleep pattern starts to go, these are all early warning signs that maybe they need a little push to go to a meeting. But it's difficult to push to go to a meeting because, you know, there's a friend of mine who's in recovery who says, an addict is the person who's most likely to need a hug and the person who's most likely to tell you to go away. Not very polite. <laughs> so it's about getting that balancing act right, you know, and having some compassion, but also for yourself, because you need to look after yourself. It's true, and there is a fine line between, you know, maybe encouraging the family member to get to a meeting, but at the same time, it's about the family member, the partner, whoever it is, taking responsibility for their treatment. You know, they have to put the action in, because... You know, it's very common that the family members have worked a lot harder in the addiction than the addict, the enabling side of things and the stress, the worry, the sleepless nights. Um, yeah, so it's important for your loved one to actually want recovery, to actually step outside of the comfort zone and, and really apply themselves um, to, to life. Uh, and it can be difficult. So yeah, it is a fine balance. Um, and it is about implementing boundaries. And, you know, there's research you can do on how to do that as well. So I'm sure there'll be a topic that we'll, we'll put on for you. Maybe that will help you along with that. So, yeah. So thanks for watching Family Involvement. Again, I'm Chris. I'm Sarah. I'm Doug. <laughs>